So your first track that you're in your is number five? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm letting it go, I'll hold back out. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna do this station okay. ID. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. I was just doing cocaine, just smoking dope all the time. A lot of, you know, freaks were hanging around, and hustlers and hoes and pimps. This Wednesday night, Thursday morning at 1 a.m., it's the Rick James birthday special. This past Monday, February 1st, marked Rick's 68th birthday, and we pay tribute this Wednesday night at 1 a.m., an intimate conversation with the slick one himself, Rick James. The highs and lows of one of funk music's most influential rock stars of the 80s. Only on Safe Harbor. This Wednesday night, Thursday morning, at 1 o'clock with the G-Spot. On KPFK 90.7 FM, well, I Los Angeles. Rick James. This is a funny Rick James. I have a poem about well, that. Well, really, they didn't give me a lot of years. I was facing three funny. lifetimes. I didn't believe that girl <laughs> so was laughing. talking about torture and all that kind of crap. I would have been yeah, sure yeah. the rest of I have an interesting story about Rick James. It's funny. <laughs> You're listening to KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, 93.7 San Diego, and 99.5 Ridgecrest, China Lake. You're listening to KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, 93.7 FM San Diego, 99.5 FM Ridgecrest, China Lake, and always worldwide at kpfk.org. This is Moxie Poetic, Truth with Aesthetic, part of KPFK's Safe Harbor series from midnight to 3 a.m. Monday through Friday. I'm your host, Sydney Phelps, and I'm very, very pleased to be bringing you tonight one of LA's very own live in the studio poet extraordinaire, Tika Lark. First, let's go ahead and start things off with our opener poem of the night. This one is a classic by Frank O'Hara. It's called The Day a Lady Died. It is 12.20 in New York, a Friday, three days after Bastille Day, yes. It is 1959 and I go get a shoe shine because I will get off the 419 in East Hampton at 7.15 and then go straight to dinner and I don't know the people who will feed me. I walk up the muggy street beginning to sun and have a hamburger and a malted and buy an ugly new world writing to see what the poets in Ghana are doing these days. I go on to the bank and Miss Stillwagon, first name Linda I once heard, doesn't even look up my balance for once in her life and in the golden griffin I get a little Verlin for Patsy with drawings by Bernard, although I do think of Hesiod trans Richmond Latimore or Brendan Bean, new, Brendan Bean's new play or Le Balcon or Le Migre for Genet, but I don't. I stick with Verlin after practically going to sleep with conjurings. And for Mike, I just stroll into the Park Lane liquor store and ask for a bottle of Strega. And then I go back where I came from to 6th Avenue and the tobacconist in the Ziegfeld Theater and casually ask for a carton of Galois and a carton of Picayune and a New York Post with her face on it. And I am sweating a lot by now and thinking of leaning on the John door in the five spot while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Mal Waldron, and everyone and I stopped breathing. That 
that was a classic of Frank O'Hara's, again called The Day Lady Died. Okay, so uh, we have Tika Lark here uh, in the studio with us tonight to hang out and read some of her poetry. No, I love that you read, read Frank O'Hara. That's like one of my favorite poets. So like people were like, oh, okay, who are your favorite poets? And it's like, Frank O'Hara is always like one of the people that I always say. Well, I say Frank O'Hara, Frank Bedart, um, Dorothy Parker, um, Allen Ginsberg. But I mean, you know, it's, it's so weird like that you, that you, you pick that because I have the um, lunch poems in my car right now. I have that, that collection, so it's just weird. But go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, was was a total coincidence. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, did you read that? And I'm like, I'm like I don't think I've actually ever written it. I don't think it's on the internet anywhere, but okay. A lovely one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, uh, that poem was in an anthology of poems given to me in an intro introductory poetry class by a teacher. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. cool, awesome. But yeah, warm welcome, very warm welcome to Tika Lark. Thanks for being here tonight. No, no problem. Thank you for having me here, Sydney. It's absolutely <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, Tika is the founder and publisher of the community print newspaper, The Morningside Park Chronicle. Mm -hmm. She founded Brick Bat Review, which is a broadsheet that covers both art and poetry. And she is the founder of Black Girl, which is a weekly show that airs online at blackgirl.com. That's spelled B-L-K-G-R-R-R-L. And it's uh, the same title of an annual book fair that she started. May 28th. <laughs> May 28th. Yeah, that's going to be the second annual. Yeah, it's going to be the second one, yes. Yeah. yeah, the first one was a great success. Yes, it was. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this, this woman is incredibly driven and accomplished and uh, no stranger to KPFK. Uh, she was the producer for Feminist Magazine. Yeah, I was one of the producers on Feminist Magazine, so. Yeah, yeah so yeah. welcome back. Yeah, so welcome yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> welcome with, with the wonderful Lynn Ballin, our, our fearless leader at Feminist Magazine, so. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, Tika, so what are you going to share with us tonight? Well, I'm going to share um, um, my poems from um, Queen of Inglewood, which is a, a, a collection of, of, of poems that are coming out from um, uh, Writ Large Press, which is a press with uh, Chi Wan Choi, um, Jessica Sabalas, and Peter Woods, who is a homegrown press, which is awesome. Um, but I'm going to read the, one of the poems to like, just plug in my publisher, but you know, I like to plug people. <laughs> All right. Um, this is called, um, As a Hostess, I Only Got Paid Extra for the Drinks. If you drop a lamp at an L.A. party, just walk away. Of course you feel bad. It's your friend. It's your friend's stuff. But keep in mind, it's just stuff. I remember you two had that conversation the other day about the meaninglessness of stuff, Buddhism, and not being attached, and all that kind of stuff. The people who got a lot of stuff tend to be into until their stuff starts breaking. What was that? What? That. That's just the music. Did you see the movie Sideways? It was actually quite good. So if you drop a lamp at an L.A. party, just walk away. I know in the Midwest you don't do that. I know on the East Coast you don't do that. I know in the South you don't do that. But out here in L.A. in the land of the size two, 50-year-old housewife consultant who's having prescription drugs makes her not get injured anymore and her little cokehead 13-year-old who has a very special relationship with her husband's business associate. But at least the 13-year-old isn't sleeping with her husband anymore. That was so much worse. What a little whore of a 13-year-old. We do that. We walk away when we drop a lamp. We walk away if you drop. We walk away from broken stuff. Do you want to get sued? Do you have a limited income? Are you a trust fund baby? Are you perfect? People who have business cards will have to answer no. If you come here from somewhere else, don't pick up a lamp at an L.A. party. Don't admit to breaking a lamp at an L.A. party. Don't admit to anything at an L.A. party. Maybe that guy's a producer or that gal's a director. Maybe they've had enough to drink to believe that you are perfect, beautiful, talented, and part of who they are. The they who are talented, beautiful, and perfect. You don't want to ruin that image of perfect by being on your knees, picking up pieces of glass, because that's where you'll end up. You won't be able to find the vacuum cleaner, because you'll be too drunk. It will be too dark, and if you do find it, you won't be able to turn it on, because you'll be sprawled out on the floor while everyone else is downstairs having a good time, laughing at you, the person in the dark sprawled out on the floor. Don't pick up a broken lamp at an L.A. party because only out-of-towners care about the broken pieces of glass on the bedroom floor. So that was one of my 
poems about like Los Angeles and uh, and uh, it's kind of funny because that, that was I was like it was kind of based on a real story. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I do a lot of dramatic monologue, um, so like, uh, like if, um, I always tell people like, yeah, you should really look at Frank Bedart. I mean, there are poems, poets that are great poets that are around now that are not dead, <laughs> that are masters of, of their, of their craft. Um, Most definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, do you want me to read another one or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. def but let's, um, yeah. tell us again what the title of that poem is. Um, as a hostess, I only got paid extra for the drinks. So I mean it, it's it's very Los Angeles. You kind of don't get it because hostesses um, is kind of like um, if you're a hostess at certain places, it's kind of like you're a, a, a I guess a sex worker. So it's kind of like oh I only got paid extra for the drinks. I didn't do anything else. I just got as long as I got them to buy more drinks. But it's kind of like this whole thing about like Los Angeles and the, the you know what you have to do in order to be successful. Yeah. Well, actually, just America in general. I use Los Angeles as a as a, as a symbol of capitalism in the United States. <laughs> so, for for anyone who's just tuning in, we are listening to LA-based poet um, extraordinaire <laughs> Tika Fleming. She is out of Inglewood. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Tika, um, let's hear another. Okay, sure. Um, downtown LA is not racist. The black guy is masturbating again on 6th Street. These homeless people are getting ridiculous. These, this is a pro, this is, there's this program up north with, where they nicely ship them away for work programs. It's really nice. I don't know if happy adverbs can make an internment camp sound okay. Melina just cares about Latinos. Melina hates white people. She doesn't have a bike. She didn't go to the bike meeting. We need more cops. We need more security. Another black guy masturbating. I have a picture. I got up at 4 a.m. and I caught him. My dog needs a place to run. Can we make that park private? We are bringing back Broadway. Those businesses weren't real. You know what we mean. I find your accusations that I'm racist offensive. Here we go again with the race card. You people on the race card. My name is James T. Butts, and I'm black, and I'm here to let you know Bob isn't racist. That black homeless guy is out of control. No one was even talking about race. Obama is the best president ever. This time, it's an Asian guy masturbating on 7. Did not know they could be homeless. I thought that was a black thing. What? I'm not being offensive, just honest. I went out with an Asian lady once. She was real Americanized and talked too much. I had to break up with her. I'm not racist. The Irish were the first slaves. I'm not Irish, but I could be. There you go again with the race card. Race is relevant here. Your accusations of racism is why you people are masturbating all over the place. And I voted for Obama. I told you that. That was L.A. poet Tika Lark sharing some of her work with us here on Moxie Poetic, part of KPFK's Safe Harbor series. Um, you know, Tika, I have to say it seems that you wear so many hats uh, in addition to all of the things that you've been involved in that I mentioned previously. You were also the Arts Commissioner for Inglewoods District 1, a former board member of the Valley Contemporary Poets. You have curated literary uh, readings for literary arts centers all around the Los Angeles area. Uh, so all of that being said, I want to ask you, how do you identify first and foremost? That is so. That's a, that's, a, that's a strange question. But it's actually a good question. I'm a I'm a writer. Okay. That's how I identify. You know, I'm a writer. Um, and the thing is that when you're a writer in 
in Los Angeles and you don't do um, TV and you don't do movies, <laughs> it, it's kind of like you have to create your own, you have to create your own venues and you have to create, not only do you have to create your venues for yourself, you have to create venues for other people to, to participate um, because you want to yeah. have your friends, you don't want it to just be you over and over and over again. Um, so, I mean, I love, I mean, I love journalism, so I'm like, I, you know, but I see myself as a writer, because I like journalism, I like poetry, I do like fiction, I do, um, I play writing. You write essays. Yeah, essays, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole thing, I'm not, um, but I've, I've never been into, like, TV or anything like that, um, being in Hollywood, which is weird, because I write a lot about Hollywood, but I don't write for Hollywood, so it's very, um, but I, I guess I, I, I always have identified as, as a writer, um, even though I've been called so many things, but I'm like, I'm more like to the arts, I'm more into like writing so than, even though my writing is political, I would like to, you know, people kind of, sometimes they'll be like, oh, she's an activist. I'm like, I've never said that, you know, because then it's like, you know, I'm at a party and I'm like drunk or whatever and party, I'm like, well, you, I'm like, I never said that. You, you said that. If you look at my bio, I've never said I wasn't like a, I, I have always said I was a writer and I'm, I'm all about expressing myself and pushing limits and pushing boundaries, whatever that might be, and the, being a disruption, being a disruption to capitalism, being a disruption to the mainstream, being a disruption to the status quo, and sometimes in regards to, it, it, sometimes you can't be like uh, an activist and do that, you can't be like, because you have to kind of like build bridges, and I'm not really about building bridges sometimes, I'm about burning stuff down. <laughs> sometimes it needs to be burned down I don't want to you know so that's that's kind of my thing I don't know if I'm making any sense um, but um, I'm very um, but yeah a writer that's just a just a but I, but I talk a lot but go ahead, go ahead. you can go to the next question if no you want. <laughs> we, we are here to talk about you and mm -hmm. um, I would like you to speak as much as your heart desires <laughs> okay okay cool cool but uh, yeah yeah so speaking of uh, wanting to burn bridges down, like kind of just tear shit up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you you are a graduate from uh, Mount St. Mary's University. <coughs> yeah, yeah. You studied philosophy there, Correct. and that is an all female Catholic affiliated. It's Catholic university. It's, it's Catholic. I mean, I, I've, I've spent like I said, I've, I've done sixteen years in time, sixteen years of time in Catholic school. I mean, but you know, I really, really like. Um, I have to like to like to plug Mount St. Mary's. I really like Mount St. Mary's. You know, a lot of times, um, people have these challenges when they were in college, and they talk about, oh, it was really hard in college, and especially if you know if you're if you're a person of color and you're like you go to college and you have this, this ex people have these experiences. And, you know, the thing is so funny is that I, I had such a supportive environment at Mount St. Mary's. I have no idea what we're talking about. Like in regards to like. I mean, you know, you had women there, you had, it looked like Los Angeles. Mount St. Mary's is one of the rare colleges, like four-year institutions in Los Angeles that looks like Los Angeles. I mean, it, you know, it's a diverse campus, but not only is it, it's like economically diverse, it's racially diverse. I mean, of course, we're like a lot of us are Catholic, so maybe it's a little bit higher, more Catholic than it typically is in real life. <laughs> but right. other, other than that, you know, um, but it, it was a, you know, it's also too, it's very like um, social justice oriented, very, um, you know, um, it, it cares about the community, it cares about, um, it cares about creating um, women who care about other people. And I think that's very important. It's not a gimmick. It's like a real thing um, about Mount St. Mary's. And it's, and, um, and I think women institutions are very, very important. Um, and it, 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 you know, because you, you get to, you don't have to, you're not like an exception. This is like how you, this is who you are. I mean, you, you get to go out there and when you're in the classes and when you're, when you're participating, it's not like you have to force your way in because it's like you're already accepted. Of course, like in every system, you know, you know, there is institutional sexism, even within all women's institutions, you know, just like, you know, if you go to a black college, it's still going to be like racism within, because it's part, it's a systematic thing, it's not necessarily an individual thing, but you know, I think Mount St. Mary's does a, a really, really great job at um, giving women um, of all, of all, giving women um, the opportunity to be the full, the full people that they, that they, that, that we are. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. yay, yay for Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, yay for, I, mean, I, give them, I give them a whole commercial. They should, like, <laughs> put me in their magazine again. I was in their <laughs> alum, like, uh, alumni magazine. I was like... 
Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your new book, The Queen of Inglewood? Okay. Um, the Queen of Inglewood, it's, it's a great, like, little collection. I actually have written something down. Let me see if I can actually find it. I probably can't find it now because, you know, the thing is that when you, try, when you, when you write something down, you never can find it when you actually need to put it. With, but it doesn't matter. Okay. What it is is a collection of stories, Germanic monologues. And it's about, it's a critique, it's satire. There's a critique of capitalism in the United States. It's a critique, but I use... I use um, I use Los Angeles, but I use Inglewood because Inglewood was supposed to be the place where, okay, the rumor was there was a theater right up the street from my house called the Academy Theater, okay, and it was built in 1939, and the thing was that it was like this this, this rumor that the first Academy Award was supposed to be in Inglewood at the Academy Theater. Now, if it was true or not, it doesn't matter. But that's the whole thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was true or or not true. It just matters that it. It was supposed to happen, and it didn't happen. And it was kind of like, oh, you know, Inglewood was kind of like the Hollywood that didn't quite happen. It was kind of like, and, and all everybody in this book, Queen of Inglewood, it's all about these people who kind of made it, but not exactly. Like, oh, I, I could have been a star. I could have did this. I could have did of all these, like, but it's kind of like they were grasping for this kind of a idea, um, this kind of like, Grasping as like for perhaps like grasping for capitalism, grasping for materialism, and then failing. But because it's kind of like this idea of what what success is is so warped, and it's kind of like just mocking that, um, and uh, kind of but but making it kind of entertaining, like being able to talk about it in a way that's that's uh, that's that's not just it's political, but it's also I feel like it's entertaining, but also kind of historical because it kind of talks about lots of parts of Los Angeles that I think a lot of people kind of don't like that don't really know anymore like i mean the parts of los angeles don't exactly exist because i use a lot of hollywood um i use um I, I reference hollywood a lot like a lot of, a lot of old movies so i use a lot of old movies when i'm talking about it even though i also do you um, reference a lot of music <laughs> when um within the poems but i try to try to have them so people can understand them on several levels. Like they can understand them if, if, if you're if you know if you're a literary person, you can understand it. If you like music, you can understand it. If you like poetry, you can understand it. If you, you know, if you just like pop culture references, you can understand it. So I try to write on, on all those levels and, and I try to have it so that people, I try to write, I always like, I write poems for people who don't like poems. Like you don't have to pretend like, like when I'm, when I'm doing, when I'm reading, when you're reading my poems or when I'm, when I'm reading them, you don't have to go there and go, oh, this is supposed to be poetry, so I have to act like I like it. Or this is supposed to be political, so I have to act like I like it. Because I know a lot of that stuff out there is really awful. So I try to just not, because I mean, I do, I care about the audience. I try to be entertaining. I try to write for, um, I try to write for um, the public. Because I do, I'm trying to inform, but I want to inform you and I want you to be entertained. I mean, I think about like the people that, another, you know, people that I do admire, I, while I admire, you know, poets, I also admire um, uh, musicians like um, you know I think about like uh, like Patti Smith and like um, Polly Styrene um, you know like the X-ray specs I mean it's just you know I I kind of want to be able to tell a story and be entertaining I, um, I was listening to I, I'm on like I think about Liz Fair I listen to a lot of Liz Fair which is like you probably can like you know she probably can, can I should probably like you know, you know I really like Liz Fair we should all we should hang out I think she lives in Manhattan Beach or something like that um, are you listening? <laughs> are you listening, Liz Fair? <laughs> um, but I, you know, I like telling stories, and I like, um, and I like entertaining people. I want people to like want to to continue to read it. Um, and I think that's kind of like what makes me a little bit different. I think from a lot of poets out there, who are like, I don't care if anybody likes my stuff. I'm just doing it for me. I'm like, this is not to me. I feel like art, poetry, um, fiction. You're, it's not therapy. I mean, it can be therapy, but like, how dare you like take people's time and like, you know, working out your own stuff. I'm not saying I'm not working on my own stuff, but it's like, that's not, that's, I'm, you know, it, that's, you don't need a free therapist. You know, there, there are, they, now they have ACA, you don't need that. You can get your own psychologist and get paid for Obamacare. I want to say ACA, people are like, what are you talking about? Okay, Obamacare. Oh, yeah, I get it now. Okay. So, um, I try to, you know, I try to, yeah, while, while I am working on my own issues, <laughs> I also really do um, try to um, tr try to be entertaining and educating to the public. Yeah. 
Wow, that that was such um, a great message that you got across right there that not a lot of people articulate often, uh, you know, about using using your, your poetry not entirely for selfish reasons. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, wow, okay. So you, it seems that you definitely use quite a bit of satire, you know, humor mm -hmm. to, to, in your poetry to connect with, people who aren't into the super serious kind of traditional stuff yeah. um, but if we could maybe be serious for just a quick moment you know if if there is one message that you feel personally compelled to get across to Angelinos right now what what is you know a, a message that you would want to say to the people listening in the city. I would like people to know that there are no rules. Anything you want to do, you can do it. And just because someone has a lot of money and a lot of power doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> I don't know if that, I wish I had like a good, like like one like line, but I think that's, you know, um, you know, cooperation. That's all, that, that's my other I think cooperation. Cooperate with your fellow people on the street. That's, that's my message to Angelinos. <laughs> All right, and tell us one more time, Tika, where we can find you online, in person, whatever. Okay, um, you can find me, uh, Tika, T-E-K-A, Lark, L-A-R-K, um, at blackgirl, B-L-K-G-R-R-R-L dot com. But the thing is that you just Google me, just Google Tika Lark and you can find me. Um, I'm having um, the Black Girl Book Fair is May 28th. Um, I'm doing a lot of readings and I feel really bad that I don't remember like where I'm gonna be doing these readings at, but I'm gonna be doing a lot of readings in March. For some reason, people forgot me in February. <laughs> so, um, so I'll be doing a lot of readings in um, um, uh, 826 at uh, David Rockland. I'm doing his reading um, in, uh, at the 826, I think it's the Rorschach reading um, in March at some point. Um, I'm doing uh, something with Art Share with F. Douglas, but that's May. So I mean, I'm doing a lot of a, a lot of things, but I can't remember. But if you Google Tika Lark, I'm like the only Tika Lark. I think there may be one other Mustang. I think there's. I think I'm the only Tika Lark online. So you can easily find me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you spell that for our listeners? Sure. Tika T E K A um, Lark L A R K. All right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming into the studio and speaking with us and sharing some of your art. It was really quite a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sydney. It was, it was great. I mean, it was like, it went really fast. I'm like, oh my gosh, that has a lot. <laughs> it is. It is a quick little um, half hour show. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much again. And best of luck with, uh, with the book fair, the Black Girl book fair that's coming up. We hope you come. We hope you're there. <laughs> We hope Sydney's there. I'll be yeah, there. Yeah, she'll be there. You need to have a little booth, like a little table. I'll be there yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Cool. Okay. This is Moxie Poetic on KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles, part of the Safe Harbor Late Night series, which is Monday through Friday, midnight to 3 a.m., Make sure that you stay tuned for Roy, Roy of Hollywood coming up next. And don't forget to shout us out on social media. You can like our Facebook page, uh, KPFK Safe Harbor. We have a Twitter handle, hashtag KPFK Safe Harbor. You can uh, let us know what you think of this new programming. Also, poets, LA-based poets, if you are interested in being featured on this show, get at me. You can send me an email at moxiepoetic at gmail.com and all of the episodes of this show are on SoundCloud. You go to soundcloud.com slash moxiepoetic to listen to the archived material. Thanks for being with us tonight we'll be here next week kpfk safe harbor thanks again to tika lark for coming in at this hour and big ups again to gary baca for holding it down on the board moxie poetic style with aesthetic <laughs>